<laughs> Liam, where are you at, Liam? What's good? How are we doing? Good. Uh, um, give, give me a minute to sort of settle in. Uh, uh, I have two instructions. One, I have to find Elliot. All right. And two, even though Giselle warned me, this has happened. This is the second time on this stage this has happened where Giselle says exactly what's going to happen. And then I'm not sure. <laughs> And then I get here, like, I don't know what's going to happen. So uh, my comments, uh, I'd start with thank you, Dr. Anatol, because originally I was informed that I, the introducer, would be introduced. Um, but here I am. So I'm going to still start with the same thank you, which is uh, big ups. <laughs> <laughs> and I owe you an email. <laughs> uh, big ups and, and a good thank you to Dr. Anatol uh, here here at the Hall Center. I want to begin by kind of taking it in. I wasn't sure what we were going to be together gathered tonight, um, but I see some nice faces. That's all so orienting, uh, and I'm going to ride that out into the middle of my comments until I start to make sense of what's going on here. All right, so I want to begin by thanking the co-sponsors of the event, the Hall Center, that's where we are, uh, the Departments of English, African American Studies, uh, American Studies, and Sociology. And we'd also like to thank the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Center for Gender and Sexual Diversity. Uh, these co-sponsorships have been made possible by a lot of work by Dr. Hannah Britton, uh, who is um, automatically programmed to deny the compliment. Uh, <laughs> it's just, you wanna do it again? You ready? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hannah Britton. Uh, uh, and uh, also to Amara Simmons, who has been doing a ton of work to help us organize the last couple of days. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I think that the communication, the effort has led to a pretty satisfying visit, um, certainly, but also a smooth visit, which is always welcome, right? Uh, so our talk tonight here is hosted Come on in. I know it's busier than you thought it was going to be. I guess Phoebe, everybody. Come on in. Jean Vaccaro, everybody. Come on in. <laughs> Our talk tonight is hosted by the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies uh, and the Vern Wagner Visiting Scholarship. Uh, fellowship. Uh, we, with this fellowship, seek to bring a leading scholar to KU to meet with students and faculty uh, and to present a public talk to our community here. Since my arrival in the fall, you might think I've been here longer, but it's been, it's been all quite recent. <laughs> uh, since my arrival in the fall, the department has really worked to facilitate conversations that I can't help but think are in part uh, to help me think. Uh, and for that, I am very grateful. In many ways, uh, our visitor tonight feels like an invitation for several other conversations that we will be having. So I take your attendance seriously and we thank you for being here. The land we are gathered on, like so much of the United States uh, and perhaps so much of the world at this point is traumatized by the ongoingness of colonization and the bitter ripples of our colonized minds. I invite those of us who find home here for now to be in solidarity with the struggle, to think more carefully about what happens here at KU uh, and perhaps in Lawrence and perhaps in Kansas and perhaps on settled territory more broadly. May we all start a more honest and genuine relationship to the land. Tonight's talk, much like a belly laugh, a long, slow walk with a friend, a good hug, 
or set of difficult questions has been one I have longed for. Those are short-term ways to quench one's thirst, and mostly this is my own. But like seeds in the ground, or stories passed down, or prophetic dreams, the body of work that Professor Marquise Bay presents is cosmic in its orientation. Glossing a gloss, Bay makes frequent reference to the murky citation of Moten via Sidia Hartman that black trans feminism might make us freer than we want to be. It is in this reconfiguration on the run that tracks the ooze of the body against the ontological assault of prescribed normativity. Can we unfix this attachment? Can we abandon gender or race? Can we, to take Bay's gesture towards pleasure, treat black trans feminism as a box of chocolates rather than as an identity formation? Can cis people stop being so cis? <laughs> <laughs> Can we all, in a capacious collaboration, remain in the question? and the interstitial bop, the transfigurative potential of letting go, or as Kamala Hicks is helping me sort out this week, putting the shit down. Encountering Bay's work for me was much like encountering a friend on the beach in the moonlight. The ideas come easy, the steady crashing soothes as it reminds of the power of the tides shifting. In the work, you will find blackness and fugitivity, transness and the crossing, and many lessons from black feminist theory. Something happens when we look for problems, though, and we find them. <laughs> uh, and interestingly, Bay uh, started their undergraduate studies uh, looking for problems as a biology major. I have to imagine that if they stayed in those rooms, biology would be better for it. As a professor of African-American studies and English at Northwestern University, Bay thinks deeply as a practice, takes curiosity as a cause and creativity as a method, boasting a theoretical corpus that resists the traps of inclusivity or belonging that are often predicated on having the keys to the plantation. In place of interpolative effects known from Fanon's Hey You, Bay asks that we take Fred Moulton's advice and move from critique to study. What fractures can we usher in on the way to excess? What fractures are possible through the excess of theorizing? As a person who has been all my life too much for other people, Bay's theories are a bomb and a solve, and a solve for the libidinal structure that sets gatekeeping in its sights. Bay's work is a delight. Shh. It's not you, it's Outlook. <laughs> Don't take that burden. <laughs> Bay's work delights in the details, curates a higher ground, and sweats on the on-the-line politic of blackness, of transness, and of their transversal and always knowable jailbreak from what we have already imagined. The work is difficult because these are difficult questions. How might we live? How might we abandon? How can we learn to fly? Shout out to Giselle Anatol hosting a uh, conversation with my favorite children's author from my favorite children's book, The Year We Learned to Fly, Jacqueline Woodson. <laughs> <laughs> Bay is particularly concerned with modes of subjectivity that index otherwise ways of being, utilizing blackness and transness as fugitive extra ontological postures as names for such otherwise subjectivities. Before I read the next paragraph, I want to remind you that as far as I know, we are still in the 2023 timeline. Dr. Bay earned their PhD from Cornell in 2019. And since then, and I am not messing with y'all, they have published five books. <laughs> 
And we're not talking like nada, right? Look it up. <laughs> the work speaks for itself, but the books include them goon rules, anarcho-blackness, black trans feminism, system failure, and one of the most formative forerunners that I have ever read, and I really do read them all, The Problem of the Negro as a Problem for Gender. I won't make you all feel bad by reading the journal articles. You can look that up on your own. That's probably my time. Uh, but I will offer uh, from firsthand uh, knowledge that the generosity of professor based thinking, their willingness to think, and think with the kind of feral promiscuity that is so often impossible uh, in the demands of academic life and perhaps more broadly life in general. I want to introduce tonight's talk, Transinsurgency, Black Radicality, Abolitionist Endeavors. It will be an attention and an invitation to all of us here. I urge you to take it up in the spirit of Audre Lorde's reminder of the poetic revolutionaries and meditative gun runners that are already among us, that are already in the room. Our lives, perhaps many lives, are on the line. Please help me welcome Dr. Marquise Bay. Can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? I'm very soft spoken. Oh, damn, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Hey, okay. I need to follow that. Okay. Let's try. Let's try. Um, thank y'all for being here. Um, I really deeply appreciate all of you being here in this space, gathering with all of us today. Uh, I think that's I think that's quite important. Uh, I think that's quite meaningful. I think that matters a great deal that we're gathered here with one another, uh, engaging in this this work in whatever ways and whatever capacity that we have. I think that's quite meaningful and impactful. Uh, so I will begin. What I wish to set out to do with you all today in the 35 or 40 minutes or so that I have is not to, it's to not so simply tell a story. That story is a theoretical and philosophical one to be sure, but it is also in the vein of what might be more readily understood as a story, sharing a narrative, a telling. To put it a bit less cryptically, I want to tell the story of an idea. In the academy, oftentimes we simply assume that these ideas come fully formed via a particular scholarly origin. But here, I want to share with you all not the scholarly origin per se, as if there was a singular origin to the idea I will be sharing with you all. Not the scholarly origin of these ideas of Black and trans, but I want to tell their story, their story for me. I want to tell the story of how they were gifted to me albeit piecemeal, by so many others, expected and not expected. I want to tell the story of how they came to be formulated in the way that I formulate them, how it feels to live with and through these ideas. I want to tell the story of where they have come from and where they might go. In short, what I will share with you all is the story of what I have come to call Black and trans, and it is a story not often told. I begin almost two decades ago. Long have I been a shy kid, though not friendless. Indeed, I have long had more friends than I wanted. <laughs> I, have <laughs> <laughs> I have, though, been wondering as of late if there was something to that, as I imagine that there was, and certainly now is, something that indexes a certain reworking of where friendship might lie, and in what friendship was grounded. This is simply to say that my friends were and are a bit eclectic, by which I simply mean there was a way I moved with folks who often would not move with each other. White kids who introduced me to rock music and video games that someone like my brother wouldn't even consider, hardcore Philly dudes who smoked blunts while tucking Swisher sweets behind their ears for later, punk rocker girls who dyed their hair weekly, nerds who fit almost to a T the stereotype of glasses and suspenders wearing nerds. There was something about all of them that resonated with me, 
and something about me that resonated with them. I don't know what it was exactly, but I know it wasn't what was expected. And lately, I've been thinking about how it is possible that that something was a kind of ineffability, an illegible disposition toward dissent and proprietary escape that inflects in a number of ways. Sartorial impropriety that signifies a fed upness with respectability, or rock music that indexes a break from the austerity of white life, or drug use that references a broad discontent, or a different kind of intellectualism that meditates on the ills of the world. All of these things, for me now, inflect a thread of some kind of break or breach from normativity, from decorum impropriety. And it seems to me that I've been forging relationality and indeed subjectivity with myself and others on those grounds, rather than on grounds understood as more proper. This very idea of the proper is what is breached. This idea of there being a specific way to inhabit the world, a particular and specific way to be and live and relate. The notion of the proper infuses itself in so many aspects of what it means to live and indeed constructs the very limits of what valid life entails, a validity that rests on racialized, gendered, sexualized parameters. So what I wish to ask and what I was asking back then through my friendships is what if we did not adhere to, align with this notion of the proper? What if we in fact emerge onto the scene of relationality with others on grounds improper? Grounds that in fact forsake the notions of whiteness, of cisness, of masculinity, and even humanity, all of which ground a proper relationality. What if we relate to ourselves and others, other living and non-living entities? What if we related to them radically differently? This is how I enter the black and trans in the telling of this idea. What I want to share now is a burrowing into the complexities of these terms that so often are assumed to mean so much less than they do or can. I want to open up these terms, black and trans, in ways that might in fact be quite terrifying and understood as wrongheaded. But I risk this terror and this wrongness on the off chance, which I think is closer to an on chance, that the risk will pay off as something marvelously beautiful something that will allow us to experience what we didn't know was even possible. And I think we de deserve that. I think we, in so many illegible ways, yearn for that. So, part one, Black. It is now 2015. I entered Margot Natalie Crawford's graduate seminar, 21st Century African American Literature, knowing that that class, or week two of that class, would change me we read Fred Moten's essay, Black Op. I had been chasing after a justification that would be legible to others, that would make others see and feel what I saw and felt regarding the impact his brief claim had on me. As he writes, and I quote, everyone whom blackness claims, which is to say everyone can claim blackness, unquote. It was and still is indefensible, and yet I defend it or not defend it, but seek to proliferate it, live via it, emerge in its excess. 10 years later, as he published that essay in PMLA in 2008, he extends this meditation, putting more language that I use for justification of the indefensible. In his book, The Universal Machine, which came out in 2018, Moten writes, and this is a long block quote, and I will warn us that Fred Moten, for those who have not read Fred Moten before, is one of those critical theorists and poets whose density is unfathomable. Like it is, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot sometimes. But nevertheless, I'm gonna read the block quote and hopefully I'll be able to tease that out. So Moten writes, quote, while as Fanon asserts, there is an imposition onto the figure of the black that would signify the confluence of racial identity and racial inferiority, there is also, in a way that is prior to the regulative force of that imposition and cause it into question, a resource working through the epidermalization of a phantasmatic a inferiority as the anti-epidermalization of the radical alternative to which the peoples who are called black 
have a kind of underprivileged relation in and as the very history of that imposition. One might speak then of the blackening of the common, which would imply neither that any and every person who was called black claims or defends the socio-poetic force of that fantasy, nor that persons who are not called black are disqualified from making such claims and enacting such defense." Unquote. What Moton is saying here in his characteristically frustratingly dense but beautiful way is that there is not simply one typical way of understanding blackness. On the one hand, surely there is a way of understanding blackness as a property of those on whom a certain racial inferiority is placed, absolutely. But there is another way to think through blackness, a blackness that is not reducible to this conception, but is rather not a specific racialized category that exceeds and obliterates the grammars of that colonial vestige of hegemonic normativity and violence called race and racialization. Blackness, for Moton at least, becomes not simply a racial category innocently described and reproduced instead, or supplementary. Blackness names the abolition of coloniality, of circumscription, of capture and captivity, the categorization along lines of the colonial notion of race included. This is Moton. This is what someone like Moton, as well as Denise Ferreira da Silva and Hortense Billers and Ashan Crowley and even Toni Morrison, I would argue, and I would go to bat on that. <laughs> This is what these people are saying. And yet, even though these thinkers are beloved, few people approach blackness in this way. But I think I want to approach blackness in, in this way via these folks who have been deeply impactful and influential for me. I wanna to try to take them terrifyingly seriously. Someone like Moton is hot right now and has been hot for a while. That heat, however, to me, is rendered lukewarm, if not cold, when those touting and amplifying his hotness are pressed. They say under, <laughs> they say under commons, they say study, they say in the break, but they don't say something like paraontological. They don't say that blackness must be understood in its ontological difference from black people. But I want to say these things and must say these things, even if they are hard to hear. If, as Moton says, feeling and thinking and living with many others, blackness is not reducible to a demographic category. If, as Moton says, blackness is the unoriginal displacement of ontology, phrases that I've been forced, blessedly so, to live with, then I must refuse the conception of blackness as an identity, even as a form of non-identity, predicated on wound and deprivation, and to regard it instead as a modality an open modality, a kind of fugitivity. And I can go on ad nauseum about how I'm understanding fugitivity. It is because I've sat with Moton and others too that I think this and must enact this. I've sat with and have had to sit with, have understood sitting with as an ethical terrain, someone like Hortense Spillers, who has said in a reading of Ralph Ellison, and this is from the introduction to her um, collection of essays, Black, White, and In Color. People always talk about mama's baby, papa's baby, but she's written other things that are also really, really good, really good. So Hortense Spillers, who has said in a reading of Ralph Ellison that blackness marks a symbolic program. This is a direct quote. Blackness marks a symbolic program of philosophical disobedience that will make the former available to anyone or more pointedly, any posture that is willing to take on the formidable task of thinking as a willful act of imagination and invention, unquote. I have sat with Kai M. Green, black and non-binary and the deepest lover of black and trans people who has said, quote, not all black people relate to the category or are marked by the category in the same way. Your blackness might not be legible in certain places. Black is a category that we all have the ability to move in and out of, unquote and asks of everyone looking to be in coalition, quote, what do your politics look like? What kind of work do you do, unquote. And I've sat with Ashan Crowley, who has said black social life has been the constant emergence of abolition as the grounding of its existence, the refusal of violence and violation as a way of life, unquote. And I've sat with Zora Neale Hurston, who has said that all skin folk ain't kin folk. And I've sat with others still. 
That sitting has led to all this mess and I will continue to sit. Why is it that I've come to not being able to not think and feel and theorize this? What is it that I am trying to convince others and myself of? Perhaps I am not sure and yet I continue because I continually search nomadically for language and politics and affects that allow us to move differently. I'm searching constantly for a way to get us out of captivity, a captivity so many of us sometimes covet and misunderstand as loving and necessary. I want the kind of freedom that Sidea Hartman mentions, the freedom of radicality that, as she says, will make us freer than we actually want to be. I want that. I cannot abide our capture and seek a thoroughgoing abolition which must include any and all forms of violence and captivity, whether more legible forms of carcerality or colonial vestiges of hierarchy and power and normativity. Blackness as a term and idea references this. Part two, trans. I was sitting at a table on the patio of a lovely little restaurant in Dartmouth with a colleague and our new friend. This was a number of years ago and during our walk, I shared a bit about the writing that I do, that my intellectual pursuits revolved primarily around blackness, trans studies, and feminism. It was made clear that my political commitments were focused on gender non-normativity, on gender abolition even, and the ease and comfort with which I used the words trans and they pronouns and the language endemic to queer and trans cultural productions attested to a certain level of dexterity with the topic and a certain proximity to its effects. Our new friend, as we sat, shared her own scholarly pursuits, that of Asian American literature and cultural studies. Somehow, and I truly do not remember how, my colleague, a white woman who brilliantly writes about indigenous and African American speculative fictions, noted how her and I have had numerous conversations about the ethics and navigational attention of those of us who are presumed quote unquote outside of the implicit demographics of the disciplines we take part in, or how we are assumed to be specific kinds of subjects by virtue of the things we write and think about. And then we are deemed as unexpected or improper to the subject sometimes when we show up or the ways in which we show up are wrapped up in the assumptions of what kinds of people are proper to such modes of writing and thinking. As I spoke and referenced the ways I am thrown around discursively in and around trans studies, our new friend interrupted me and said, wait, I'm confused, are you trans or not? This or something like this has happened to me about two dozen times now uh, and counting being invited to give my personal story on black trans identity or asked to participate in all trans panels leaves me with a deeply vexed feeling. And once I had, this is a true story, once I had a grad student tell me that mad people assume you're a trans man. Most times I want to deliver an entire lecture on how I reconfigure transness and understand, understand it as much more robustly than many what I'm doing now. But oftentimes, I do cower and capitulate, unable to fully say what it is I must say to stop the assumption from occurring, unable to say in not so many words, yes, but no. Not the kind of trans you likely think, which is likely the only trans you think there is. There is another way, are other ways to do and be trans and I roam there. I'm vexed because these assumptions are neither true nor false. It would be at the very least, it would at the very least strike others as ethically suspect for me to just go along with the thinking, thinking that I'm trans in the typical medical juridical way, as I do not and have not had those experiences, ones commonly attributed to many self-identified transgender people undergoing medical and psychological scrutiny and surveillance, having legislation passed to invalidate my gendered existence, encountering violence in its various specters on the street because my voice or my body or my walk does not quote unquote match assessed gendered cues. These are not experiences I can claim as my own, experiences that very often go under the banner of being transgender. And yet, I so badly want to live an intellectually rigorous and constituent life. 
I want to take seriously the words of the thinkers and activists I so dearly respect, many of whom have and will grace this talk. They have edified me, maybe even corrupted me, to think in a way that expands the capacity of trans to hold so much more than it is believed to be able to hold. That trans, far from being simply a name for moving from one gender to the quote unquote other gender, references something more, a tinkering and fracturing of gender itself as a coherent, seamless regime imposed as an apparatus of capture a politicized misalignment with gender with normativity writ large and interrogation of non-consensual impositions of paltry options bestowed upon us before we even show up in the world, a fed upness with gender itself as a necessity for relating to others. And I'm reminded too of this, um, this moment uh, that Judith Butler shares uh, in a talk that they're giving <clears throat> and how they're in a hotel room and uh, the one of the people who work for the hotel need to enter into Butler's room to check the mini bar. And then Butler, looking like Judith Butler, opens the door and this person who works for the hotel is like, Mr. Madam, Mr. Madam. And then Butler, in that really characteristically witty and quick way says, do you really need to know my gender in order to enter this room? Those kinds of moments where the literally the social interaction is stalled because one cannot place gender. That's what we're talking about here. That's how I'm understanding gender as doing that kind of thing. What would a trans that references the vitiation of this stuff, that references this capacity, what would that entail? What kind of rethinking would we have to undergo if that were taken brutally, terrifyingly, seriously? If I may, I want to share something from one of those OG trans activists that hit me really hard when I encountered it. That activist's name is Ricky Ann Wilchins. Back in the 1970s, there was an annual festival called Michigan Women's Fest, and that was women spelled with a Y. And Mishfest, it was called, in which the organizers of that festival excluded trans women uh, under the understanding that trans women were not real women. Wilchins, for folks who are not aware, was one of the people who organized a counter festival, as it were, refusing the trans exclusion of Mishfest. From here, Wilchins creates a collective of radical activists they call the Transsexual Menace. I read about this in Wilchins' book, Read My Lips, which is a phenomenal text, a phenomenal, phenomenal text, and also underread text, I think. I think more people need to read that. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And I so badly wanted to be down with the menaces, but when reading about this gloriously trans radical collective, didn't think I, among others, were allowed. I just knew that one had to be understood as, in the very typical medical juridical way, transsexual, Wilchin's chosen language, in order to be a menace. I just knew that my desire to be a part of the collective was just another non-trans adjacent effort of colonization and appropriation. This was a number of years ago. I've learned since then. <laughs> but that couldn't be it, I thought. This way of thinking feels too radical to lap up these staid rote rules for exclusion, I thought to myself. And I think this is very much the case, it turns out. Quote, this is Wilchins, first of all, you don't need to be transsexual to be a menace. Anyone can be a member. It's more of a disorganization than anything else, unquote. And this is not a move of absolution or cis capitulation. I wanted to and want to now still take this seriously. If anyone can be a menace, a transsexual menace, what does that make the designation transsexual menace? It makes it, I think, categorically irreverent. And one comes into menaceness to the extent to which one irreveres, one does not revere the categorical imperative, to the extent to which one refuses trans antagonism, not the extent to which one quote unquote is transsexual, the limits and scope of which are always and already under a kind of scrutiny. To be a menace is to menace, to threaten. To be a menace is to threaten the order, to threaten organization, to be a menace to the binary, whether you look like this or that. It is about how you menace the regulative regimes that say you must look like this or that. 
Those regimes demand so many contortions into non-chosen categories, and that is the issue here. So since, and this is Wilchins again, since even such hard categories as gender, race, sex, and orientation are not causes of our oppression, but its effects, we need a new kind of political struggle, one that seeks not just to overthrow the oppression, but the categories as well, Wilchin says. We need what I might call a kind of trans-insurrectionary abolition. That is what our understanding of trans moves toward. This is what I always want to say to people who seem to have such a flat, collapsed notion of trans. It is this kind of trans that is embedded in the idea of it that I offer here under the banner of abolition. A trans that does not wish to align with gendered mandates and regimes. A trans that misaligns, that runs from the side of the binary deemed proper to you, and that runs from the sides altogether. Because what happens when you do not run back to the side we've been said to stay on? What happens when we rebuke in infinite ways the ways they've lashed a specific address onto us, onto our documentations and IDs? And frankly, it is not even about the address on your ID. The address they said would never change and the address that must define you. Because how many times have we gone to the DMV, presented our documents, coercive and surveilling documents, been asked if the written address is still current and said no. Sometimes we feel ashamed, but how joyous is the feeling of having moved elsewhere to somewhere unsanctioned by the regulative mandates of two rigid identification documents. It's that joyfulness in the moving elsewhere that I am after. Because really, we are and must always be moving. That ID says I live there at that address, an address on their grid. But really, I'm not always there. Right now, I'm here in this DMV. Sometimes I am in my car, on the road, which is where I might feel most comfortable. Sometimes I stay with a buddy for a week, crashing on their couch and eating Pringles while binge watching reruns of The Office. <laughs> sometimes I'm at work or on campus or at the store or running errands. And yes, sometimes I am at the address on my ID, but I am in this room, then that room. Sometimes I'm in the shower or in bed. Sometimes it is dirty or clean. Sometimes the aroma lingers from the feast I prepared. And sometimes I have guests over, some of whom stay the night and some of whom forgot their bags, which go into my closet for years. Is that the same address? It is not then that I want the address on my ID to match where I am because I am always elsewhere. I want to be elsewhere, unable to be addressed. This is my trans of running ceaselessly away from the address that they put on my ID. Part three, abolition. We likely know the now famous Moton and Harney definition of abolition. If, and if you don't, I can give that for y'all. And we also likely know the ways Angela Davis and Miriam Kaba and Erica Miners and Ruth Wilson Gilmore all ground knowledge of abolition as such. In the synthesis of these key thinkers, I want to offer abolition as a name for the cultivation of a life and livelihood whose emergence actualizes via the impossibility of violence. Abolition as that which calls and invites us into an otherwise mode of life, where the circumscriptions, normativities, realities, laws, and the like do not and cannot enter, opening up massively different possibilities. Perhaps what is meant by the abolitionist is a way of orienting to the world and others that seeks insistently to eradicate forms of carcerality and violence a way of trying to be with others in ways that do not curtail their possibilities or dispose of them or punish them by violating the things they might want to be for themselves. The abolitionist, in short, tries to make the very framework of capture and punitivity nonsensical. It is not reactive against bad prisons, but a way to make forms of carcerality impossible. So allow me, please, a quote from the scholar Dylan Rodriguez. Quote, abolition seeks as it performs a radical reconfiguration of justice, subjectivity, and social formation that does not depend on the existence of either the carceral state, a statecraft that institutionalizes various forms of targeted human capture, 
or carceral power as such, a totality of state sanction and extra state relations of gendered racial colonial dominance, unquote. What Rodriguez provides me, and I think us in our politics, which is understood broadly more than just partisan governmental politics, but politics as an insistence on how we wish our world to be and what we will and must do to create that world. That's how I'm understanding politics in this more capacious way. What Rodriguez provides us in our politics is a demand to radically reconfigure what counts as work and agitation and imagination. What it looks like to live in a just society and world what it looks like to be a valid being and person and subject, what is possible for how we move alongside one another, all of these things in a way that does not rely on carcerality. There are so many ways that the carceral limits what we are able to be. Of course, there are institutions that cage people on unjust grounds, detention centers and jails that deeply negatively affect black and queer and trans people. But there is also the carcerality of the gender binary, of colonialism, of our very ways of talking to and about people we care for. What would a world without even that be like for us? I want to begin from this vantage to imagine that because I think we deserve it. This is a fundamentally political endeavor, not so much one of a possessed identity. The emphasis on the political scope of this to be a bit more clear is not to imply that those of us falling within some permutation of black and trans, those of us who are racialized in ways that disallows movement and enactments, those of us who are or who have certain reproductive capacities that are legislated in certain ways, or those whose embodied comportments are subordinated by cis patriarchy, those of us who are gender non-conforming or non-binary or depart in whatever way from the genders we've been and continue to be assigned, not to imply that we must always in our very being be doing radical things. Certainly we deserve very much to rest, to not have to defend ourselves at every turn, though we know this is crucial for survivability. I don't mean to place an added burden onto us. Rather, the distinction I make, lovingly so, for the black and trans here, opens them up to anyone doing a particular kind of work with respect to or with disrespect to the ravages of gender. It is, following the wonderful scholar activist Kathy Cohen, not merely an identity that one possesses and that's it. These terms, these terms mark a subversive relation to power that is moved in and out of, that is open and attentive to how we relate and importantly to how we wish to create different kinds of worlds. There is a deep validity to the typical ways people combat injustices and fight against systems of oppression, policy change, protests and marches and the like. I, however, want to offer another way among these ways, a way that is perhaps quieter, but no less loud, subtler, but no less impactful. The kind of abolitionist radicality I want to propose is one that invites a different way of relating. That relation is one that encounters others on grounds of openness, refusing the foreclosure that is assigning gender or imposing an archive onto others before they even arrive onto the scene of encounter. It is one that commits to the sociality of being and becoming other than what we've been said we need to be. I know these seem small and they are, but I want to hope that they bear on how we feel with others, what we think with and about others. Because the smallest refusal of imposing onto someone else a pronoun, for example, might usher in the refusal of gender, the refusal to gender that person, the refusal to predetermine that person. And that right there might be the first time they have felt truly, if only fleetingly free, and that matters to me. Abolition is not one spectacularized event, but a constant working toward eradicating carceral logics as necessary for sociality and relationality. Like what Sarah Lambeau terms everyday abolition, I offer abolition as, quote, changing the ways we interact with others on an ongoing basis and changing harmful patterns in our daily lives, unquote. Questioning punitive impulses and relations to captivity. This is abolition in a broad sense, 
the making impossible of carcerality, any form of captivity. We create abolition and do abolition in each moment we move toward the alleviation of subtle ways of curtailing the ability of anyone to become liberated. I'm not all that good at the practical and the concrete and being a critical theorist and trained by philosophers. <laughs> So I apologize for not providing a blueprint because I know so often folks want blueprints. But I do think that part of this non-concreteness is purposeful and perhaps is itself practical advice that there is a way we can remain loose and unsettled, unsedimented as a practice of justice. That looseness opens up doors, in fact, unhinges the bolts on doors so that there are no doors. And that is truly scary. But I submit the black and trans as letting that door dissolve without a bouncer checking names, which means that whoever shows up will be let in unconditionally and without conditions. The person who has identified as trans for one hour is included in this, as well as the person who is looking to learn more, who might have some gender normative baggage, but is nonetheless trying to leave that, as well as the person who might not think too highly of departures from racialized gender. Yes, the law might send agents to infiltrate our conspiratorial sessions, that is for sure. But I hope this does not inspire fear in us, though I know that fear is very real. Why would we let in someone or something that might harm us, especially in a space we hoped was safe? I suppose all I might say about this is that I want so very much to expand the people who love and fight and care and affirm and proliferate the possibility of us, which of course includes us. So I am promoting via an abolitionist framework of refusing to dispose of anyone, refusing to say that someone does not measure up or say that someone is irredeemable. And to say that someone doesn't measure up or that someone is irredeemable is part and parcel of cis normativity and white supremacy. Promoting this non-exclusivity because the very scary and risky possibility in that is that those who do not want us to exist might be moved to become otherwise. Because also entering into the new world the new mode of relating means that whoever enters will not and cannot be the same. The relation touches them such that they are no longer the same as before they entered, and that shift can be everything. Blackness and transness might be precisely in their openness, the cultivation of the soil, such that it might be lush terrain for those who have not been permitted to arrive onto the scene. And Coda. We know it is important and boilerplate at this point to enumerate the dead. This is an ethical gesture, one with crucial implications. I am not someone who pedestals a mere remembrance of the dead, those who have met their deaths by anti-Black or trans antagonistic or patriarchal violence, nor am I someone who wishes only for marginalized people to be alive despite everything we might face. I am, in other words, as you might guess, not very interested in ends and endings, which is not to say they are unimportant. It is to say that the end is not the point, not where the work is done, not where we are made aware of an injustice. What is unjust is precisely what precedes the supposed end. What is unjust are the terms of living, as Cameron Awkward Rich, Black trans poet writes, quote, there is something deeply unsettling, that is, to the insistence that someone ought to be alive in a world that did little to support that life, he says. And I feel that deeply, I do. And it is exactly this that propels me always to think about, mobilize around, how the terms of living might be cultivated such that they finally allow for not even those who were barred from the social world but even those who we didn't even know existed. And this right here is where we might find our abolitionist politics, making and insisting on a world that is cultivated for those we knew not existed, and we will love them. Thank you all so much.
thank you all so, so much for this. So I believe we have time for a Q&A right now. And I know there's always, I'm vamping a little bit right now to, for folks to gather questions, but I also know that there's often this kind of weird, strange 20 second lull at the beginning of Q&A. Um, I just want y'all to know that that's okay. Um, that can be that can be incredibly uh, robust with a whole bunch of other things that are happening. Maybe you're thinking, maybe you're just a little bit nervous. All that stuff is totally fine. All that stuff is totally fine. But of course we got two questions <laughs> right here. So all that was for naught. All that was for naught. <laughs> please, please wait until uh, I come around with the microphone for the sake of the recording Wonderful. so that we have all the questions on the recording. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Hello, That's hello. Get us, Elliot. Okay. Um, I'll just to get it started, I like the, the, the phrase at the end, uh, the cultivation of the soil. And I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you know, environmental disaster. So you, you don't, you is, don't uh, really sort of delve into it in this place, but I'm just wondering if maybe you can kind of reflect on some of the maybe mandates you see from the kind of the fugitivity or the fleeing from identity categories that might have something to do with the land or or our our environment or our ecosystem or absolutely absolutely i'll speak briefly to, to that. that's a lovely wonderful question so i think one of the things when i'm doing my whole anti or non-identitarian thing uh it's not simply because i hate these categorizations though in large part i do uh, <laughs> but it's also because it feels to me that these categorizations uh they they promote this particular kind of uh, individualized understanding of ourselves that then necessitates certain kinds of relation when it seems to me if we dissolve those things or if we recalibrate it, how we understand who we are, who we can be, that then will allow and facilitate other kinds of relations. Uh, so to say that I am this, this, this racialized human being, and that means then by virtue of the notion of the category of the human, uh, that means that I have authority over this land or this environment, that I can pillage it, that I can extract from it. When if we retool what that means or in even dissolve what that means, then that means I necessarily have to have a different kind of relationship uh, with other kinds of entities. So what then would it mean to no longer have to be this kind of a capital H human subject, but in fact, one with the environment or thinking about my myself as an extension of these kinds of environments rather than as a kind of lord over this environment. So for me, the anti-identitarianness is very much in service of thinking about other ways we can move in relation to, to various kinds of things in ways that are more loving, in ways that are kinder, more generous, um, more attentive and ethical to how others might show up. Because I'm also thinking about the ways that to prescribe an identity onto someone means that they are one of the, the phrases, the philosophical phrases I often use, and I get this from a philosopher of race who I have a whole bunch of disagreements with, but uh, this is a person who uh, talks about existence ahead of oneself. This notion that even before someone shows up, they are already predetermined. That seems to me exactly what identities do, uh, that you aren't even able to show up to the encounter because you're already prescribed a certain kind of way of inhabiting the world. So what then would it mean? <laughs> What then would it mean though? What then would it mean to actually take seriously that I don't even know who will show up before the encounter happens? And that I think will allow a much more ethical relation to others because that might be the first time someone discovered that they can be something else. Uh, and that to me is a beautiful possibility, a beautiful possibility. Uh, so I wanna try to dissolve those kind of things in service of different ways of moving in the world, ways that are softer to tread more lightly on the earth. Uh, like that's what I really, really want. And it seems to me that's a little bit more possible when we think differently about what it means to be a certain kind of subject uh, rather than this subject that then has a kind of authority over this other kind of subject, but rather an extension of all these other ways of moving in the world as a part of a plenum rather than this kind of individuated subject. So I think there's a relationship there between the anti-identitarian and the environmental or the spatial or the geographic or the all that kind of stuff so yeah wonderful question though the question here yeah wait for them we'll wait for the mic 
<laughs> Thank you so much. That was um, really brilliant and um, um, really thought provoking. So I really enjoyed it. I'm wondering, it seems to me that part of what you're describing is what I would call having grace. So allowing, so um, not pr this idea of not prescribing and not capturing um, identities in, in certain ways and allowing more fluidity. Um, how, it, I feel like we've, we're not really moving in that direction in society, um, that um, people are increasingly um, rigid about saying, okay, you don't fit um, or your response is not what I believe it should be. You don't fit the way um, I think you, you know, you should mm. inhabit the earth. Um, and so I'm going to cut you out and just kind of go to this separate place where people act in the way I think they should or the way I define them. Um, how do we, how do we get past that? Yeah, that's hard. Yo. That's really hard. <laughs> um, because so I, one of my dear, dear academic friends uh, is um, a scholar by the name of Lamar Jarrell Bruce. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Lamar Jarrell Bruce. He is the kindest, one of the most generous souls I've ever encountered in academia. Um, but one of the things he said uh, a few times is that like intellect is cute and all, huh? but what about grace? What about kindness? Those things. Uh, and for me, uh, the language I, I often turn to is generosity because I am very much a student of Fred Moten, who's a student of Naomi Chandler, who is then thinking with Du Bois and is talking about this concept of generosity without limit. And I love that so much. I love that so much because to me, I think you're absolutely spot on about this kind of assessment of the, the contemporary landscape, that there is a lot of rigidity. There's not a lot of room for a certain kind of grace. Um, but I, I want to, I guess it's, it's very much more of a belief um, than anything, but I want to believe that proliferating this grace allows others to be a little bit more graceful. I remember actually when I was in graduate school and uh, one of the uh, people in the cohort above me uh, who was like, continental philosopher extraordinaire. Uh, she was incredibly, incredibly smart. And we were having a conversation. She's also someone who doesn't really like Fred Moten. And anyone who doesn't like Fred Moten is just suspect to me. Uh, <laughs> but I'm talking to her and uh, and we're, we're having a conversation. We're talking about Moten and a whole bunch of other things. And she was saying something to me. And instead of, I imagine what she's often encountered was this kind of a uh, very academic, I'm going to defend my point and I'm going to point out your logical fallacies and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't interested in doing that. I'm still not interested in doing that. Uh, I want to try to hear you. And I, I that that makes sense to me. I really like that. That's making me pause and think, which to me is a demonstration of a kind of grace. And that then allowed her to pause. She said explicitly, you know what? No one has ever like engaged with me in this way. I really appreciate this. Like Those kind of things make it feel to me that the demonstration of a kind of grace or generosity uh, allows for others to feel that that's possible. Because I think I also understand these this rigidity as not simply a rigidity for rigidity's sake, but also a kind of defense mechanism. Uh, these are ways that people are trying to defend themselves, especially people who understand themselves as under siege and in peril. These are ways that they try to kind of bolster their intellectual reputation or to try to bolster their own survivability all those things uh, and to be met with a kind of grace to to know that they will not be shut down or met with harm in this interaction. I think that allows people to be a little bit more vulnerable uh, to think and feel in different kinds of ways. So I think I want to, and I have a bunch of colleagues who think I am naive uh, and maybe I am naive, maybe I am naive. That's okay to me, uh, that's okay because I think, I think it's still, I think it's still absolutely worth it, absolutely worth it to encounter other folks in this kind of way because someone might, I don't know, there might be the person or the people who feel that that moment of grace, uh, that kind of graceful encounter, then it facilitates something in them that facilitates a different way to be uh, that they haven't never experienced before. So I want to try to do that. And I'm believing, I'm choosing to believe that that grace allows for other people to possibly demonstrate a kind of vulnerability or to see that no, I don't have to be this way. And I think that's all I really, really want, um, that I'm not here to convince or persuade people necessarily. Uh, it'd be cool, though, if y'all were on board with all this. That'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. 
Uh, but I think for me, it's ultimately a kind of, and I've been saying this, I think the whole time I've been here, uh, it's very much a kind of invitation into a conversation. Like you might come along for this journey for one stop and that's cool. You might be along for the whole ride, but nonetheless, you were here. And that matters a great deal to me. You were still here. So I wanna I wanna try to, to demonstrate that in the kind of graceful or what I understand is graceful interaction with people. And it is hard sometimes. Oh my goodness, it's hard sometimes. Some people, God, some people are frustrating. <laughs> so, so frustrating. Uh, so it makes it hard in, in those instances. But nonetheless, I do think it's, I think it's important in some kinds of ways. So yeah, but it is difficult. It definitely is difficult. The question here. Oh, um, question right here. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Dr. Bay, amazing work. Thank you so Marquise, much. For, please, just Marquis. You know, yeah, you yeah, no I just wanted Bay. to <laughs> in front of people I wanted to give you some fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Marquise. But yeah, fair um, <laughs> um this might sound like a um bad faith question to people who might not know me, but you okay. Um so transness but not queerness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, um, particularly for someone who identifies off and on as genderqueer sometimes, but non-binary sometimes, um, the word trans, to your point, mm -hmm. there's a way that trans is represented in the media mm -hmm. as a particular... <laughs> I, I don't want to misuse the word thing, but of course, oh, right? For sure, um, for sure. Real, um, there's a way that trans is um, misrepresented. Um, so sometimes I find myself um, kind of dealing with like internalized queer phobia um, and dealing with, okay, well, I can't use trans in this particular <clears> context <throat> because I'm not that kind of trans, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, which is, I think, why, and I think quite a few um, queer folks do this um, or gender non conforming folks will choose queer or genderqueer or trans for a number of different reasons but but why trans is perhaps instead of queerness or maybe it's not even instead or it might be along with or alongside but why trans is specifically instead of that i think there's a way particularly in the the metaphor that you used around the address which i really really appreciate it there's a way that queerness does that similar work for me but there's a way i think that movement and transness is so important to your argument that maybe I'm also not catching as much. So yeah, so yeah, why, for sure. why, why trans is not queerness? Yeah. And maybe not even be a nod, but. Yeah. Great question, great question. Uh, so two quick points and then a slightly longer point. Uh, it's certainly not in an instead. It, they're very much in conversation with one another. Uh, I, in many ways for me, I could not have gotten to trans studies without queer theory. Uh, queer theory was my intellectual home for so long, still kind of is. Still kind of is, um, but it's certainly not an instead. But I think you're also absolutely right. There's something with something about movement in the trans that I'm really drawn to, incredibly drawn to. There's a kind of movement, which is then to say for me, a kind of fugitivity in trans that certainly is not not there in queerness, um, but there's it's doing a different kind of work. Uh, it's not doing more or less important work, but it's doing a different kind of work, which then gets me to this last point. Um, one of my favorite moments of Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's book, The Undercommons, uh, which is freely available online if you haven't read it. It's amazing. Oh, so good. So good. Um, but in the that 60-page interview at the end of it, Fred is talking about, I'm just going to call him Fred because I know him. Um, <laughs> Fred, and I think he'd be very okay with that. But Fred is talking about how he was in the car once driving somewhere and his kids were in the back and they were playing this game that they called family. And and then one of his kids, I think it was Lorenzo, uh, who said, um, dad, do you wanna play this game with us? Uh, and then Fred's like, okay, tell me how to play the game. And then uh, Fred's kid says, we got this, we have this box and we got all these tools. Uh, and if you use this tool, you can enter into this box. You can enter into this space. And that's how I'm kind of understanding trans. It's not, it's about entering into the space. Uh, it's about entering into this mode of being, mode of inhabitation. Surely certain tools can get into this box in different kinds of ways. Multiple tools can also get into the box. There are some tools that because I'm using it, maybe I don't have the strength to 
lift this sledgehammer, but someone else does. So they'll use a sledgehammer, but maybe I use this lock pick, but someone else is not really dexterous with a lock pick. There are different ways to get inside the box, but it's not about the thing itself. It's about being in the space. Uh, so for me, trans is one of those tools that allows us or that allows me to get into a certain kind of space, a certain kind of inhabitation or exhabitation of the world. Uh, and it allows other people to inhabit or exhabit the world in a certain ways. But for some other people, queerness does that work or some other kind of way of moving through the world does that work. So for me, it's not about the word. The word is not, this is one of my grasp. The word is not the thing. The word is not the thing. The, there are other things that are the thing that we're trying to approximate with this term. And so I, I'm incredibly, or maybe not incredibly, I'm very just kind of like non-covetous or non-proprietary over these terms. Like for me, it's whatever allows you to do a certain kind of work. That's the thing I'm interested in rather than the thing itself or the word itself. So how are we moving in certain ways that are ultimately liberatory, radical, et cetera, imaginative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so maybe maybe the work of trans does that work for you. Maybe it does that work for you later on. Maybe it did that work for you. Uh, maybe it doesn't now because of various kinds of congealments and sedimentation and all that kind of stuff. These things are always in motion and, and fluid and all that kind of stuff. What works for us in this moment to get us to do the certain kind of work that we're interested in doing? That's what I think I'm, I'm interested in ultimately. Wonderful question, Anthony. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. For, thank you for your talk. Thank you. I am wondering if your ideas have any implications for how to deal with some of the current anti-trans legislation and people who are trying to force people into boxes and punish them if they don't fit. And yeah. Do you have any ways of dealing with them? Sug any suggestions? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Wonderful, marvelous question. Very important question, too. Not really, <laughs> like not really, because I think I, yeah, not really, because I think on the one hand, I hope this doesn't feel like a cop-out answer, uh, but on the one hand, it will, because trans antagonistic and anti-trans people and policies, they are, they move in different ways. So this policy might have this kind of effect in this place, and then this other one by this person is doing something different. So I think one is absolutely necessary to have many different approaches to this, which I think is also why I'm pretty, pretty uh, promiscuous with my thoughts, I suppose, um, because we require so many ways to combat the various heads of trans antagonism. Uh, so I think on the one hand, there's no one way to do these things. Um, because encountering this turf on the street who does something will require something else uh, as opposed to doing something in response to this policy. So it will require a bunch of different things. I think also what I'll say is, while I think it's deeply important and I, I wanna put a full stop at the end of this, I think it's deeply, deeply important to combat various notions of trans antagonism and anti-trans and all their myriad manifestings. I think that's absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial because these things disallow people to move in certain ways, to feel comfortable, to literally live. All that's important, full stop. I also think it's, I'm not gonna say more important, but I, I do think it's quite necessary and imperative for us to say, Fuck that. I'm over here. We're over here loving on each other and caring for each other. So I'm less sometimes, sometimes I'm less interested in what they're doing to us and more interested. In how are we looking at and caring for and living with one another? That's, I think, incredibly important. So often the way that we come together are about having to fight that. I don't want to do that all the time. I don't want to do that all the time. I want to be like here kicking it with y'all rather than thinking about what they're doing out there or what they're trying to do out there. So I think there's a whole bunch of value in that as well, because if this is about livability, part of that or a big part of that livability is living with one another. Huh? And that is a very capacious one another too. Who is in the struggle with us? Who is here trying to find joy and trying to imagine different kinds of worlds? Who is here trying to promote care for us in a whole bunch of ways? I wanna be around those folks. I wanna gather with those folks rather than and simply saying, oh, we need to fight this policy or that policy. Sometimes I get, I don't know, I'm just, I'm going on and on. But yeah, I, <laughs> I got just, I just really, really want us to, to think about, think about how are we living and loving amongst one another? Uh, that's the thing that I'm, 
oftentimes a little bit more interested in, uh, not all the time, because sometimes trans antagonism is all up in our faces and we need to like get away from me. Um, and that's important, that's quite important. Um, and there are myriad ways to do that. People have different capacities for doing that. I, for example, might be able to punch somebody in the face, but someone else might not be able to do that or someone else might not want to do that. Someone else might have a different way of combating certain kinds of things and I want to promote all those different ways of combating that. I am so uninterested in a kind of, we need to do it this way or that way. No, do it all the ways, every single way we need to, um, because they will also come at us in every single way that they want to. So why also can't we think about myriad ways of encountering these things? So I don't have a specific response to that um, wonderful necessary question, but I do want to, uh, uh, account for that while also noting that I think I also want to various spaces of love and care and joy amongst us, irrespective of all those things that are kind of uh, accosting us in myriad ways. Um, but nonetheless, it doesn't make it less important. It doesn't. Um, so thank you for that question. I appreciate that. The other questions out here, the one over here. Hi, um, we met briefly a while ago. Love your work. Um, I, um, Okay, so you've parsed transness and blackness here. Um, so I do anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been doing, I've been planning like a medical anthropology around trans health justice for a while kind of project. Um, so I'm thinking of gender as a racial and colonial project. Um, I think I pieced it to, um, I think the, the white, the, the great race, Elon Musk kind of shit that's going on right now. Mm. Um, to me, that is of a piece with the attacks on trans folks. Oh, absolutely, my and goodness, like, yes. Are, and so like, you know, and then like the Fairman Galway scale, sorry, I'm really bad at, at the oh, no. part. Um, the Fairman Galway scale, if you ever look it up, um, it is wild, just wild. Um, but basically it is what's used. Um, it's, I don't know if you were following what happened with athletics last week where they were, they have the amount of testosterone you can have. Um, and so the Fairman Galway scale is used as a diagnostic tool for Olympic athletes, but it is literally cribbed from like texts for diagnosing eight year olds. Um, and it is wildly white normative, right? Mm -hmm. And it's about, it's diagnosing hirsutism, mm -hmm. but like, it's just about body hair, right? Mm -hmm. And like, what's normal and what's not, right? Um, and so to me, I see in medicine a very vividly violent production of a very specifically racialized trans subject, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, tacitly racialized the way whiteness works. Um, and then I think, and I've been thinking a lot about Kathy, I've been thinking, as we all do, thinking with Kathy Cohen on the regular. Yes. Um, because I've been wondering basically whether hetero, like, because I don't think heteronormativity, the way that Cohen describes it, and should I? This is, this is the essay, Punk, Bull, Daggers, and Welfare Queen, <laughs> that came out in 1997 by Kathy Cohen in GLQ. Amazing. Please read it, like, now. It is essential, absolutely essential. It, yes. it just basically argues that the, the, the policing of heteronormativity is about policing folks of color who are rendered as posing threats to the state, right? So this is the welfare queen of mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan's mm -hmm. kind of. Um, but what I'm wondering is, is it heteronormativity or is it actually cisnormativity? Mm, yeah. Um, you know, like all of the, and I, and I know I'm taking you down a road of violence that you were hoping to, you know, no, this is great. This run is great. the other way. This is great. Um, but that's, this is what I've been wrestling mm -hmm. with because mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's not the same thing. It's not about policing sexual practices or, you know, whether you're married or not, right? It's about gender, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this is great. This is so cool. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Hill Malatino, uh, brilliant, brilliant trans study yeah, scholar um, who, wrote who's written multiple books um and i think hill's first yeah i think that was hill's first book uh came out in like 2019 or something like that um called queer embodiment uh and in the last chapter of that book uh hill is talking about that very thing that very notion that when we're talking about when folks are presuming to talk about say um uh kind of homophobia or uh heteronormativity uh, that what is what 
what betides those who are the uh, the survivors and victims of homophobia and homophobic violence, that is largely a gender transgression rather than a kind of sexual practice or sexual orientation transgression. Because by and large, though not all the time, but by and large, one's sexual practices are rendered private uh, and one then understand certain kinds of gendered cues as indexing various kinds of non-normative sexual practices um, that then are met with violence, et cetera. Huh? So this is not to say that that homophobia is not a thing or that it doesn't matter or that one sexual practices don't have an effect on them. Not at all to say that, but rather simply to say that when oftentimes when we're thinking about uh, homophobic violence, that is gotten to by way of gender transgression, which is then in the realm of what we might call trans. Uh, so how then do we think about that? Is this rather than heteronormativity, is this cisnormativity? And on the one hand, I could say absolutely yes, and then full stop, done. Uh, on the other hand, too, in addition to that, on the same hand, on the other side of the same hand, uh, I would say... <laughs> <laughs> but like it's I am I I think yes certainly it's cis normativity but I think also it's mm, this feels like one of those kind of answers that I just hate when people say it's all the things it's all the things but it's kind of it's all it's absolutely cis normativity it's also kind of white supremacy it's also kind of racial capitalism all of these things are happening there but this is not to say that then we shouldn't say anything about it, um, but that, yeah, cis normativity, heteronormativity, white supremacy, all these things are bedfellows with one another. They're getting it on in a whole bunch of different kinds of ways, and they are really absolutely decimating the livelihood of various kinds of non-normative subjects, which I think is also one of the things that Coleman is speaking to, the messiness of all this, because when one presumes that, oh, this is heteronormativity, and then she's talking about ACT UP and the we hate straights and all that in the beginning, which is like kind of, but not really, because because the way that these various notions of supremacy are operating, they are collapsing things and fracturing things all the time. So when we say it's just this one thing, well, there are, there's always something else happening, always something else going on. Uh, so I think I would want to kind of uh, allow us to think about, yeah, this is absolutely cis-normativity. It's also all these other things that are happening. So how can we allow that to engender in us? Because the the, one of the things that Cohen is talking about as well is coalition building. Uh, and how then can we think about not simply this single issue politics that then is over and against other kinds of politics, but rather thinking about all these things in coalition with one another, uh, that when one is met with the kind of cis-normative violence, that's also uh, indexed in various kinds of white supremacist violence and also kinds of heteronormative violences. So I want us to also be thinking about those things as well with linguistic precision, but also with a kind of capacious, promiscuous, like you are also getting fucked over. Okay, let's talk about that. And let's think about the ways that we can also be in coalition with one another. Uh, that I think is, I mean, I love that Cohen article. That Cohen article is absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'm glad, I'm really glad you, you brought that up. Um, but yeah, absolutely, cisnormative for sure, for sure. Also these other things are happening too that is like, how are these things happening all at the same time? And what, is, what does that mean for the way that we relate to others? What, are the, what does that mean for the ways that we, that we approach various kinds of justice movements, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of things are, are happening that I find quite fascinating um, and I also find quite urgent as well. Um, so yeah, that's my long-winded answer to, <laughs> long-winded rambling answer to that question. Other things, other questions, comments that folks have, we have someone right here. Oh, someone up here. So um, thinking about the CODA and with Trans Day of Remembrance coming up, mm -hmm. how do you navigate remembering the dead to, so as to interrupt the ongoing erasure of Black and trans people, but also avoid forcing upon the dead the labor of immortality and to work for a world that did not support them or hold them or allow them to flourish? Marvelous question, marvelous question. Um, how I personally approach that. Um, we can talk about Trans Day of Remembrance, Trans Day of Resurrection, Trans Day of Visibility, all these different ways that we're thinking about TDOR or TDOB and all that. And, and I, I think 
first i surely it's important to to remember uh those who have been slain uh, that's deeply important they're the kind of uh this is a uh, m norbesse philip on the defend the dead um, it's very much a part of that tradition uh, i think also though it's how are we thinking about not simply not simply commemorating and uh continuing to uh, proliferate the names of folks who have been who have been killed. Uh, not simply doing that, but thinking about what are the conditions under which we might allow people to emerge into a different kind of life. Uh, what are the conditions upon which we might think about the impossibility of that person having to have been killed? Uh, so, in not instead of in supplement to uh, remembering the dead, I think I also want to think deeply, deeply about. Who is still living uh, and how are they still living and also how are we combating the various death dealing systems that disallow various kinds of life uh, that's what i often want tidor to to do to think about and also to the ways that and we there's so many critiques of this already um but think about the ways that largely largely overwhelmingly the folks remembered uh, for tidor are uh, femme folks of color, uh, and like what that then does to thinking about what it means to be alive or not alive or to exist proximate to uh, trans spaces or trans life and livability uh, and how to not erase that, but also how to not kind of fetishize that. There's a whole bunch of different avenues to move within that that are incredibly, incredibly difficult. Uh, but nonetheless, for me, I surely want to kind of pay a kind of homage and respect to those who have been killed. Uh, but also think very deeply, deeply about how are we cultivating and uh, moving and reconfiguring and recalibrating the conditions of life such that we are mitigating those who uh, are being met with various kinds of violences. And that's a tall order. That's a deeply, deeply tall order. I think it's relatively, do I want to say this? I think it's relatively easy to simply name all these people who have been killed. I think it's quite easy to do that. It's a much taller order to ask, how can we, in fact, make these kinds of deaths less and less likely? Uh, how can we continue to think about the ways that we care for one another, that we combat various kinds of systems of oppression and marginalization? Uh, that's a taller order. And I want us to think a little bit more about that, not to the exclusion of folks who have died, for sure. Um, but to think about how can we allow fewer people to die, I guess, is because I'm all I'm committed to nothing if I'm not committed to life uh, in various modes of life. And I want to always emphasize that uh, other people are doing different kind of work that emphasize death. OK, cool. Uh, I'm doing this other kind of project over here and I will see you on the other side. So, yeah, I want to try to emphasize those things. But it's a really important question, really important question. That's it's quite difficult, quite difficult, quite vexing and ethically complex as well. Huh? But nonetheless, a good question. And there was another question over. This feels like a Q&A that could go on for hours, but we have oh, time for one more and question. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm Ariel. Um, I do feminist legal theory. And I'm sitting here, really, I just feel like I'm a student again. I'm applying all of your thoughts onto my own life, making sense of it, reconfiguring my whole IDs, really. And um, so I used to identify as non-binary, use data and pronouns. I'm going to be a little personal, not too much. Oh, just a yeah, little, but good. it makes sense. It's, uh, it's where I come from. And um, I thought, like, you know, my body was fine. All of that was cool. I wrote an article, The Abolition of Legal Gender, nice. um, getting rid of nice. gender. I would love to read that. Cool. Um, but then I read about how estrogen makes you experience emotions differently. So I was like, ooh, I want to try that. So um, I got on estrogen, mm -hmm. and um, I was afraid of the embodiment and the changes it was going to produce in my body. Um, and it's something that I didn't want. But then all of a sudden I got boobs and like they're still growing and I love them. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because now I have gender joy for the first time. Oh, yes. And so if you bring in joy into the conversation, but joy about gender and about embodiment all of a sudden. So I guess maybe in a way now I am that trans, like that trans that people project mm -hmm. onto you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if, if we're bringing if we bring in gender joy and joy with the body, um, now I no longer want to abolish gender because it brings me so much joy, mm -hmm. precisely because of embodiment. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reconfiguring 
yeah. <laughs> my whole idea is about mm -hmm. gender. So I'm thinking now, um, that kind of trends, mm -hmm. is that kind of trends then merely victimhood of gender as a colonial tool? Mm -hmm. What do we do with that? Mm -hmm. But that trends mm -hmm. and, and, and joy that comes from gender embodiment mm -hmm. um, for your theory, like yeah. when we bring that back in, how, how does it change or yes. what do you think about that? Absolutely. That's a marvelous question, a difficult question too, um, but nonetheless, a beautiful question. I love that. Um, I'll try to be brief because I know we're short on time and people got places to go and things to do. Um, no. so <laughs> 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 but yeah, to that question. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm also going to tell a brief story. And I think I told this story earlier to today too. So I, one can imagine the kinds of responses I've gotten to my work. Uh, and they're quite understandable on the whole. Um, but I was giving a talk talking very much about the things that I've, that I've talked about today. And I am, after, during the Q&A, someone asked me, and someone who I would imagine, though I can never be sure of this, but someone who I would imagine that other people would understand as a Black woman, raised this, this person raised their hand and asked me, well, with all of the things that Black and femme and trans people have encountered all the things that we've lost uh, to take away even this from us. What do we have left? And I responded to this person's face as sincerely as I could. We have everything else. That's the thing that I am like, I, this is not to say that this doesn't matter. Huh? It's not at all to say that, uh, but it's to say that I'm just going to say it uh, like it's to say that I don't know if it's the thing. What's the thing is the joy, the feeling that you can move in a different way. This doesn't discredit the feeling that this, this notion of gender uh, feels incredibly joyful to me. But I wonder, I deeply, deeply wonder like, if it's that or if it's the something else. It's a way of being, of moving, a way of seeing yourself change, a way of refusing certain kinds of impositions, a way of existing in a world in a different, in a different way. I do wonder if it's those things that are perhaps also bringing a kind of joy um, to to you. So I never want to rain on anyone's parade. I never want to ruin anyone's joy. Please find joy in all the places that you need to. Please do that. That to me is ethically, philosophically, theoretically imperative. Please do that. I do want to, to ask the question of where that joy is located because I do think sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, it's not so much the thing that we are told is sutured to that joy, but perhaps some, th something else. And I want to try to entertain the possibility of something else happening uh, that is engendering that joy. But still feel that. Please feel that. One might find, though, that that joy is proliferated in other kinds of ways, in different ways, in another kind of world that, you know what, this gender thing, maybe that wasn't exactly it. And because of the condition, because the conditions have changed or have shifted, I'm still feeling this joy in a different kind of way. Maybe I can let this thing go and then that thing go. And then maybe I feel actually more joy because of that. Um, but nonetheless, really trying to follow what that what that feeling is and where that feeling uh, has come from. I want to try to think perhaps about that, perhaps. And I want to note that perhaps, because I also don't know. I also don't know that. But for me, what I want to insist upon is that you follow that joy wherever that leads you. I, I love that so much. I really, really do. Please continue to follow that joy. So thank you for, for that. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> This, I'm going to ask you to clap again, but this has been amazing. Like, so uh, thank you all so much for coming, for lending your energy and your thoughtfulness. And um, I mean, some amazing questions. And uh, Professor Bay, thank you so much for your, your, your intellect, your feral promiscuity. Um, what a great phrase. Great um, phrase. But also, you know, just your... Uh, your openness and your generosity um, with all of us, your time and your um, your brilliance. So thank you. Thank you again. Oh, true. This is wonderful. This is absolutely wonderful. Oh, man. So great. So great. This is amazing. This so good. Amazing. So good. Thank you so much for this. This was, oh my goodness. I feel 
Oh, this has been great. This has been absolutely amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. I really it. Like, yeah, it was good. It was good. Betty Ish.